Well, hello everyone. Many thanks for joining us for Hydroterra's next webinar in our webinar series. Uh, we've got a great turnout, uh, so I really do appreciate you guys spending the time. So today's topic is managing our air under the new Environment Protection Act. Now, originally we had uh, a representative from EPA speaking on this topic. However, unfortunately, he was caught up and could no longer present, but we're very fortunate to have Paul Bainham fill his shoes. Uh, Paul's a specialist in air quality monitoring from a company known as Moat Limited. Uh, he has got 25 years experience in air quality monitoring around the world, including countries such as Europe, US, Asia, and the Middle East. And uh, he is a, currently a senior air quality scientist with Moat. We've worked with Moat for uh, several years on and off, and they provide us with some specialist guidance around various technologies for air quality monitoring. Uh, importantly, Paul used to be head of CASMS, uh, which is the main sort of industry guidance association or Clean Air Society of New Zealand. Uh, he is no longer in that role, but he was formerly head of that for several years. So over to our presentation. Here we are. So before we get charging into this, um, we love to get your questions and uh, they form a really important part of these webinars. So if you want to ask a question, please use that Q&A section, which is at the top of your screen and type in your questions there. Please don't use the chat because it gets a bit tricky if we've got two things going at once. So into that Q&A button is the best way to go. Why do we run these webinar series? Well, we like to generate awareness of things that are going on and there's certainly a lot going on in the world of ambient air quality monitoring and regulation. Um, we also like to facilitate training uh, both in the technologies for monitoring and in the regulations that are important in that area. Finally, we like to understand industry needs and that's where we love to get your feedback through that Q&A process. So in terms of the sort of running sheet for today, I will be talking to the changes in regulations. Uh, Jason from the EPA has been uh, very generous with providing me with many notes on that. So I will run through that. Um, in terms of um, moving to, I guess, the adaptive management side of air quality and, and where the whole industry needs to go, that's where Paul is going to draw upon his local and international experience and share some case studies around where he sees this area going. And then uh, we will run through some case studies. And finally, we will have some time for Q&A. All right, so for those of you who aren't aware, there is a new EPA Act out. It, it came out in July and we've run several webinars on that. Uh, rather than going over too much old ground, we will be circulating this webinar, which has links to the EPA site, which has um, a bunch of YouTube and a whole lot of guidance around what the new EPA Act's all about. So I would stress to you to, whoops, that and look at some of those guidance documents because the game is changing. Importantly, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about the Environment Reference Standard, which is Publication 1992, uh, which came out in June 2021. Um, I will go into that in some detail. I would really stress to yourselves that. 
There's a great guidance document called Guide to the Environment Reference Standard, which has a whole lot of detail around this. It also really provides you with guidance on how these criteria are meant to be used uh, in the context of this new framework. So I will be talking to that in some depth today. Um, okay, so in terms of the regulatory framework and how it's changed, uh, it's not just the act that's changed, it's obviously the, a lot of the subordinate regulation that sits under that act. That's important to understand that. So the state environmental protection policies don't exist anymore, for example, and uh, a whole lot of the guidance documents that you may have traditionally thought of as your Bibles to guide your work are now either being rewritten or they are being linked to this new legislation. So not all is new, but quite a bit is new. Um, at the heart of the, the new regs, it really is a set of obligations on duty holders. So duty holders are people who have the potential to impact on the environment. So the cornerstone of the Act is this thing called the General Environmental Duty. Now, a lot of you may have heard about that already, so I might be going over a bit of old ground for you, but uh, it's important to understand this. The general environmental duty requires Victorians to understand and minimise their risks of harm from pollution and waste to human health and the environment. Now, that's an incredibly important sentence in this new framework because it used to be that we would play the game of there were criteria to be met and as long as we met those criteria, our liability was limited. But these days... That is no longer the case. The criteria are there to guide us into what a sort of minimum standard should be, but they are not enough on their own. What is enough on your own is to comply with your general environmental duty. So that means in some instances, the EPA will require you to do more than what's set out in the criteria, and they'll be perfectly defendable position to do that. Um, what does that mean? Well, with respect to the general environmental duty, there's five matters that must be considered to determine what is reasonably practicable for you to have done. It needs to look at the likelihood of a risk eventuating, the potential degree of harm, the duty hold, holder's knowledge about the risks, the availability and suitability of controls and the cost of controls. Now, some of those are fairly loaded dot points, right? Like the duty holders knowledge about the risks. Well, it's no longer enough to say you didn't know. Like for example, this guide to the environment reference standard really provides enough guidance to link you to practically all the various guidance documents associated with the Act. Um, to say that you weren't aware of that document is not going to be in a defendable position. So there's a lot more onus coming on us as site operators and the like to make sure that we are actually meeting this general environmental duty. And there's some really significant fines and things associated with not meeting that. So it has real teeth. All right, so on to the environmental reference standard. As I mentioned earlier, this is really replacing those state environmental protection policies that we're all probably familiar with. Um, the Act states under section 93 that the ERS is to be used to assess and report on environmental conditions in the whole or any part of Victoria, okay. So what that means is that this is a really important guidance document on how to assess and report on environmental conditions. But compliance with the criteria within the ERS does not necessarily mean you're meeting your general environmental duty. 
It's really important. It's repeated many times in this guidance document. Why is that so important? Because the intent of the Act is to move away from a compliance structure to one of continuous improvement. Sorry, before we move on. So this triangle on the right just sort of provides you with a bit of a, an idea of the environment protection framework. So you can see that the, the ERS level there is uh, really immediately below the Act. So it's the subordinate legislation there. There are other subordinate legislation as well. So there's things like compliance codes, orders that the EPA can raise, for example, as well as straight regulations. But the ERS or this environmental reference standard is most applicable to the topic of today. Okay, so I've been through this guide to the environment reference standard in some detail for you. And uh, in terms of the, the things that I now will follow up on, I, I do strongly stress that you read that guidance, but I've tried to pull out the, the nub of it for you today. So the ERS includes the following components. Environmental values, which is a statement about a desired outcome for human health and the environment. These used to be called beneficial uses in the old sets, right? Then we have indicators defined in relation to, to, to each environmental value. So once again, these used to be criteria shaded to beneficial uses. They've now decided to call those environmental values. The indicators are the parameters used to assess whether environmental values are being achieved or maintained, or if they are threatened. Objectives are the assessment benchmarks. An objective is the concentration or amount of an indicator used to assess whether an environmental value is being achieved, maintained or threatened. We used to call these criteria and these used to be the sacred cow. If you could design a facility to meet those particular objectives, then we thought that was good design and that was well done. These days under this new regime, it's not quite the same. We need to be showing that we're to the maximum extent practicable, reducing emissions, full stop. Um, areas of application. The ERS defines the areas or the area or areas to which the environmental values or specific indicators and objectives apply. For example, the environmental values, indicators and objectives for ambient air apply to the whole of Victoria. All right, so we used to have a whole lot of separate state environmental protection policies, but they're sort of bundled together in this document. So the ERS is itself made up of many reference standards. These reference standards are in groups that cover four aspects of Victoria's environment. Ambient air, ambient sound, land and water, which includes both surface water and groundwater. Now, many of the reference standards that you would have grown familiar with over the years are still really used in this documentation, okay? So they've been effectively sheeted home to this. And there's a good reason for that. They were based on solid science. So there's no reason for a lot of them to change. Just got to refresh my memory on this one, sorry. The most important thing out of this slide is the ERS does not override the GED. There is no fundamental connection between the GED and the attainment of specified objectives of environmental quality. So using objectives in this way would undermine the regulatory potential of the framework. So that's a direct quote out of this guide. So what does that mean? Let's stop and ponder that for a minute. Sorry. It means that if we meet those criteria that we've just looked at, it doesn't mean we're meeting the GED because there is no fundamental connection between the two. 
the EPA is looking at how we run our facilities in a different context. We're using the ERS to help guide us in the way we do things to sort of come up with what we think a reasonable performance measure may be. But at the end of the day, satisfying the EPA that we've met our general environmental duty is done by showing that we're continuously improving, that we are doing the best we can do to the extent practicable. So the ERS does not indicate levels up to which a person can lawfully pollute, right? That's what the criteria used to be. To meet the GED, a duty holder must minimize risks so far as reasonably practicable, including where that would provide a level of environmental quality greater than the threshold for achieving or maintaining environmental values of the ERS. So I think that's, I probably labored that point enough. Um, please keep that in mind. I'll skip over that next bit. Actually, I will read that out. So ambient air monitoring and management proposals should not be designed simply to meet the quantified objectives in the ERS. So in the past, we used to design facilities to meet those criteria. You no longer do that. You design it to the maximum extent practicable to avoid pollution. In particular, a proposal should not be reverse engineered so that the measures it proposes to comply with the GED are selected on the basis that they are sufficient to meet the ERS. Then they go on to say it is unlikely that measures developed in this way will actually comply with the GED. So there you go. So a different driver now for how we design and minimise pollution of air. Well, it's actually of all parameters. So what's the process? Well, the process is still very similar to what we're all used to. Step one, you look at the environmental values. Identify your areas of application or segments. Establish for each area the environmental values that apply. Step two, you undertake your monitoring and assessment. You determine the indicators and objectives. You measure and monitor the indicators. You compare the measure, measured indicators against the objectives, considering the uncertainty of the measurement. Step three is your interpretation. So considerations are the environmental values achieved, maintained or threatened. What is the degree of risk to the environmental values? Is the risk addressed and how? As far as reasonably practicable. Now that's a really important one. And what is the residual risk? You then undertake your reporting, make your management decisions about practice change and reassess. That's a pretty good process, right? So what they're saying is use the indicators to sort of track your performance, but make sure you're optimizing your performance to the maximum extent practicable. In this document, the guide to the environment reference standard, you'll find a couple of sections that I'd urge you to read. Chapter four on ambient air, and then appendix A. So there they go into quite a bit of detail about the derivation of various criteria and that sort of thing. I need to be conscious of time. Um, okay, so this is really just to highlight how things have changed, right? What happened to the beneficial uses? So the beneficial uses from the state environmental protection policy, ambient air quality, are now in the ERS as environmental values, along with their relevant indicators and objectives. What happened to the NEPM? Well, prior to the commencement of this ERS process, Victoria's implementation of the National Environmental Protection ambient air quality measure was through the SEP. So like many other documents linked to that environment, the old Environment Protection Act, the NEPM is now effectively linked to the ERS. What happened to the SEP? 
air quality management, the ERS replaces the SEP. All right, so a lot of change. So the ERS generally adopts the objectives in the NEPM with some modifications, including a lower PM10 annual standard of 20 micrograms per meter cube compared with the 25 micrograms per meter cube in the NEPM. The ERS also contains other environmental values, indicators and objectives that are not in the NEPM. Okay. So they do have a new category, for example, these include environmental value of useful life and aesthetic appearance of buildings, structures, property and materials. Okay, so we all know that air pollution affects those things. They now actually make us consider that. So what are the six environmental values for ambient air? Life, health and well-being of humans, life, health, and well-being of other forms of life, including the protection of ecosystems and biodiversity, local amenity and aesthetic enjoyment, visibility, the useful life and aesthetic appearance of building structures, property, and materials, and climate systems. Now, there are no criteria around the climate systems at the moment, but they recognise that we have signed up to international agreements around reducing emissions, for example. I may leave you to read through these separately to myself because we're going to run out of time for Paul otherwise. Actually, I can probably fit that one in. So in terms of indicators and objectives, the indicators and objectives for ambient air are provided in Table 2.2 and Clause 6 of the ERS. Okay, so that's where you go to find those. Then Table 4.1 in EPA Publication 1992, sorry, provides an overview of their derivation and interpretation. So you may say, well, what's that publication? Well, that's this one, the Guide to the Environment Reference Standard. Okay, so if you read that standard, and you read the ERS, you'll be in good hands. Most of the indicators are presented as concentrations expressed in parts per million for gaseous pollutants or in micrograms per cubic metre for particulates. Note, many of the ERS ambient air objectives do not represent a level below which air pollution concentrations present an acceptable risk to human health. Now, that's a direct quote. So what that means is to meet your GED, you may well have to go lower than those criteria set in here. That's just a, a little bit of an extract from that table 4.1 that I mentioned. It shows how they've laid out the indicators on the left and how they derive the derivation of the objective of those. So they actually give the reference document that that's sheeted home to, which is pretty useful, and they provide some interpretation. So there's a really comprehensive table in this guide to the Environment Reference Standard, worth a look. Important to note that the indicators and objectives only represent a limited set of pollutants, okay? But that doesn't mean that uh, we don't need to monitor them. It just means they don't have criteria for them. So in some applications, you will need to develop your own criteria and your own indicators and monitor for those. And that really is on a site-by-site -site basis, depending on what you're doing. Okay, so... <clears throat> Finally, how can the industry apply the ERS? Right? You can refer to these ambient air environmental values, indicators and objectives, and you saw a sort of process for how we can go through and assess and monitor. And that can help inform your, as a record or a report, if you like, of how you're going with respect to your general environmental duty but it's not to say whether or not you comply against that general environmental duty. It's a bit like a scoreboard, but it's not a true measure of your effort. 
So the GED is the one that the EPA is more interested these days. But you need to be able to prove that you are doing these things. And that's why we have the ERS. It provides indicators to help prove that we are performing well. I'll skip on that last dot point. Okay, so a few things have gone. We used to rely on a guide to the sampling and analysis of air emissions and air quality. That one has now been superseded. If you click on the links in this brief here, you'll be able to find the new documents. There's another one coming, okay. It's got a pretty awkward uh, abbreviation, but it's the guideline for assessing and minimizing air pollution in Victoria. This is publication 1961. So this is pretty important in the context of us doing air quality monitoring. So this guideline provides a framework for assessing risks to the environment and human health from air emissions, provides new air quality assessment criteria, which replace the design criteria in the state environmental protection policy for air quality management. It provides guidance on modeling, monitoring and risk assessment methods and guidance on how to minimize air emissions and manage any remaining risks. So what's the status on this document? Well, it's finished with its consultation and it's due to be released before the end of this year. So um, well on the way. Another guidance document relevant to today is EPA publication 1883. Now this is very much in draft, but it has been released to the Kazan's committee and their membership. And if you want to have a look at what that draft looks like, we've put a link in here for you to have a look. But you can see it's going to address levels one, two, and three of odour assessment um, and how to assess the risk of odour. Now, I'm about to hand over to Paul, but just in summary around the regs, traditional regulation involved setting a limit and assessing compliance with that limit. We're now moving towards a regime of adaptive management where we need to do the most that's practicable to do. And it's quite a shift to do that. But without further ado, I will hand over to Paul. Thank you, Richard. And uh, hello everyone there. Uh, as Richard pointed out, my name is Paul Bainham. Uh, just a quick point of clarification. Uh, Richard indicated that uh, I was the president of Cassins. I should just clarify, I was a branch president of Cassins. So I uh, just, just want to clarify that before we proceed. So uh, following on from Richard, who's basically done the really hard work in terms of digging into the regulations, uh, my job's relatively easy by comparison. Uh, I'm just uh, uh, addressing how I think uh, the regulations can be interpreted uh, from a monitoring perspective. So as Richard suggested, uh, traditional regulation or the, uh, the old uh, regs basically involved setting a limit and then simply assessing compliance with that limit. Next slide. Yep, next slide. All right, mate. You know, it's all good, Richard. So basically, previously, the, it was relatively prescriptive. It was often quite standard stripping. I'm talking about the monitoring here. So in many cases, uh, the uh, monitoring uh, for air quality uh, required compliance with a particular standard, often required uh, particular types of equipment. Uh, and generally, that equipment was quite specialized, uh, both in, in, in relatively expensive to run. So uh, here in Victoria, site operas frequently manage that equipment, but elsewhere in both Australia and internationally, uh, the equipment either may be managed by regulators on the boundary on their behalf or sometimes a uh, combination of the two. Next slide. Oh, 
So why have the regulators decided to move away from this? Well, this is part of an international trend largely, and it reflects the fact that uh, the setting a, a compliance limit is, is often retrospectively looking at whether that limit was complied with or not. It doesn't really bring into consideration the fact that in many cases, the site operators have some ability uh, to manage those emissions and improve on them over time. So, the, the previous uh, regulations are really focused on, on reducing an emission or complying with a particular limit, but going no further. Now, the regulators really recognise, uh, for example, if we look at particulate, uh, the, 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 the limits for particulate, as Richard indicated earlier, don't necessarily indicate the safe level for human health. In fact, so far, we haven't found a safe level for human health for particulate. Uh, what it basically does is it brings the level down to a risk that's deemed to be acceptable. However, over time, the regulators would like those levels to drop further, recognising that at present there has not been a, a safe level detected. The other issue is with that compliance is it generally leads to quite high costs, and that reflects the fact that the equipment and the servicing involved is relatively expensive. Next slide. So where to from here, as Richard indicated, we're, we're sort of on a bit of a journey towards a, a continual improvement or, or what's also internationally referred to as an adaptive management technique. So what does this involve? Well, basically, essentially, it, it, it involves the compliance monitoring, which is Richard indicated the RS, uh, but it's also indicating and it's imposing an emphasis on site operators or site managers to demonstrate they're taking proactive approaches so that they're not just complying with the limit, they need to demonstrate that they're going further than that where there is a breach or a problem, uh, they're taking action prior to that where possible. Uh, they're also taking continual improvement. And what effectively that means is learning from past mistakes and putting in place actions to prevent things from occurring in the future. So for example, if you have a, a continual problem with a particular piece of pit kit or plant, and every three and a half weeks, it causes a problem, there would be an expectation that over time, you would look into the frequency of those issues and look at what can be done to reduce them. Now, one interesting thing that uh, has occurred internationally as a result of this is often requires collaboration with neighbouring operators. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but uh, those of you who manage sites, and I understand uh, it's probably the majority of the people listening to this webinar, uh, you'll be well aware that uh, you don't exist in a bubble, uh, that uh, there are things occurring around your site, uh, and frequently it's the cumulative effects of those that can give rise to, to complaints. Next slide. So, yeah, so basically what I'm going to touch on now is I, I, uh, I don't want to spend too long on this, but effectively what I'm going to do is, is look at a couple of examples of, of how I see this changing. Now, before I go on, I should just point out two things. Firstly, these regulations are new, the Act is new, uh, and the interpretation is likely to change over the course of the next few years as people become more familiar with uh, the concepts, the terms, and case laws developed. So just bear in mind that uh, what I'm uh, outlining here in, in, in my talk is basically based on, on what I've seen occurring internationally uh, in relation to similar legislation that's been introduced in other parts of the world. Um, but, you know, over time, it may change slightly or somewhat, just depending on particular circumstances. So I'm going to couple on, touch on a couple of things. One is a, a tunneling and construction uh, type project, and, and, and in many cases, that'll involve uh, emissions of particulate. Uh, and then I'm also going to touch on, on wastewater uh, lagoons uh, and particularly the, the gas and, and odour monitoring side of things. Thank you, Richard. So just a, a quick refresh, and I apologise for the people that know this. Uh, basically, particulate matter or PM is a collective term. And it, co it basically covers both solid and liquid particles suspended in the air. And this can range from big particles. Thanks, Richard. Uh, hopefully not that big, to very small particles. Thanks, Richard. And those are the ones that typically the regulators are most interested in. Uh, so in, uh, in terms of the regulations, they'll often talk about PM10, PM2.5 or, or TSP. Uh, and the, the, the dust nuisance effects uh, are often uh, the larger particles, those are 20 microns and above, and they're basically collectively referred to as TSP or total suspended particulate. The health effects that the regulators are also concerned with are often PM10 and below, increasingly becoming PM2.5, and internationally, uh, there is now a trend towards uh, the monitoring of PM1. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> 
So what can happen? Well, this is an example of a solar panel uh, deployed in, in the field. Uh, there's been a, an activity adjacent to it that's covered the solar panels with dust. In this case, it was a regulated solar panels. Uh, and uh, obviously they got somewhat disappointed when uh, they lost power. So this, this is obviously a clear example of a dust nuisance event. Thanks, Richard. So in terms of ambient monitoring uh, associated with tunneling and construction, typically uh, there are the two sort of primary stages involved with tunneling and construction. Uh, the first one is, is the construction stage, uh, and that's often focused on, on dust nuisance and particles associated with the entry and exit points, uh, often may be associated with vehicle movements, uh, the transport of materials to and from uh, the tunneling uh, and boring machines. And then once the tunnel is completed, there's often an operational phase that's often associated with exhaust emissions and sometimes associated with modeling and verification. So we'll, we'll touch on those a little bit now. Thanks, Richard. So if we look at the construction phase, traditionally there would be a relatively small number of fixed monitoring stations often placed around tunnel exits uh, and the relatively expensive instruments. So they cost between forty and $75,000 to, to install. Uh, and then you've got operating and service costs, which uh, are anywhere between twenty dollars and $30,000 a year. Most of these units require mains power and they're often in very fixed locations. Thanks, Richard. So this is a, a, a brief rundown, and those of you who do this type of monitoring will probably be familiar with this type of instrument. The photograph on the left shows a typical station, um, basically uh, with a, a fence around it. Uh, and then there's three types of instruments uh, that are co commonly used. Uh, the, the one on the, uh, with the black uh, inlet is a, is a, a T-ohm, tapered element oscillating microbalance. The one in the middle is a BAM, and the one on the right is basically a... Uh, is it, basically a, a, an optical nephilometer, but it's polychromatic. Thanks, Richard. So how does the new act change this? Well, basically what we'll see is that, I mean, I suspect what we're going to see is that there'll still be a requirement for those instruments that are currently in place. But what we'll probably see over time is increasing numbers of smaller instruments. Uh, they're usually optical instruments and they transmit data in real time. Now, these instruments range in price from $50, so you can buy them on eBay, three to $50,000 uh, for the more expensive units. Typically, the units uh, for this type of application are gonna be in the price range of between six and $10,000. And I'll cover off a little bit more about these in a moment. Thanks, Richard. So this is a photograph of a typical type of instrument. This particular one has a, a meteorological instrument uh, attached to the top. And what we're starting to see is that these are not reference analyzers. These do not meet the standards uh, that uh, were set previously. Uh, but what they can do is provide quite a bit of an additional information. Uh, and they're smaller, they're lighter, they're portable. Thanks, Richard. So what we tend to see is, is during the, uh, the next phase of the tunnel operation, once the, uh, the commissioning is, is underway, um, there's often distributed networks are increasingly being used to validate models. Uh, and these low cost particle monitors generally have really good agreement with those big expensive analyzers at very small particle sizes of between PM 2.5 and below. They tend to be very useful where there's a high level of public interest or concern uh, because they can be cited adjacent to complainants' properties, on lampposts, uh, or in the vicinity of parks where people congregate. So they're often more mobile and portable. Uh, as you know, concerns or, or uh, public perception changes, these things can be relocated to different locations, particularly with roadway construction. Uh, often the, uh, the, the, the tension points will move as the road construction uh, completes. In terms of the commissioning and operation of, of tunnels, they're often deployed or co-deployed with integrated mass uh, gas monitoring options, such as uh, uh, NOx monitoring, uh, typically interested in uh, NO and NO2 and uh, carbon monoxide. Thanks, Richard. And that's just an, uh, one example of, uh, of basically some, some monitoring uh, in this particular location. It was uh, in the vicinity of a tunnel exit. Thanks, Richard. So, what are the advantages and disadvantages of these low-cost uh, particle monitors? Well, one of the, uh, just, just keep going, Richard, until you uh, cover off all those advantages. I'm just going to go over these fairly quickly. Many of you will be aware of this anyway. So they're fairly cost-effective. They're simple to operate, easy to deploy. They can often be run on solar. They don't require mains power. The high resolution, now that, that has 
some big implications for taking action. Okay, so some of those reference analyzers, they'll produce uh, 10 minute or, or 30 minute averages. Uh, these devices will produce one minute averages with you know 60 or more readings in that one minute. So what that means is that if there is a, a, a high value that's leading to an event, uh, the site managers can take action before there is a breach of consent. And that really comes back to some of those general environmental duties that I think are uh, outlined in the act that Richard covered. The uh, devices will transmit data in real time. They're obviously set up to send text and emails and as I mentioned earlier, they have very good agreement with reference analyzers at those smaller particle sizes. They can be coupled with uh, MET, MET monitoring relatively easily. And the advantage is they, they can often be rented for a short time as well. So there's no uh, uh, cost in terms of having to purchase these things if you're just doing a small validation study. So the disadvantage of these things, obviously, they're less accurate for large particle monitoring. I can go into that in detail, but I suspect most of the people here will know the reasons why that is. Uh, they're also less accurate where there's multiple sources of particulate. And one of the reasons for that is these devices basically count particles and then apply a correction, part, uh, correction factor. That correction factor assumes an, a, that all particles have the same density. Now, what that means is that if you've got particles of different density coming in, perhaps uh, construction activity, diesel smoke, bit of sea salt, something else occurring on another day, then the accuracy of the instruments tends to become more unreliable. Um, the other disadvantage is that there's a large number of monitors on the market. Okay, uh, I think at last count, of, uh, I counted over 140 of them. There's probably more now. Uh, and it can be quite confusing to collect, uh, select the correct advice. Some of them are simply no random number generators. Uh, and some of the key features that are essential to make good measurements uh, are outlined there. Thanks, Richard. So just in summary, in terms of these low-cost particle options, they're great as an early warning tool, uh, often as part of a distributed network. And some of those accuracy issues that I mentioned in the previous slide can be addressed in part by co-locating them with a reference analyzer. So those, some of those more expensive analyzers uh, that we talked about earlier, uh, you can co-locate the, these uh, smaller, cheaper devices alongside those to develop a correction factor and, and then distribute them and, and move them around uh, as things change. And they're also very useful for post-construction uh, uh, validation studies. So the slide on the right there just shows an example of, of a number of these devices just being uh, mounted alongside a, uh, a reference analyzer just to develop that uh, correction factor I mentioned earlier. Thanks, Richard. So now we're just going to uh, touch on uh, gas monitoring of lagoons. Uh, so uh, traditional monitoring stations, those of you who, who operate those type of wastewater treatment plants will be well aware of the, uh, the types of gas monitoring. I'm not going to go into detail, but typically hydrogen sulfide, ammonia or VSE monitoring. Thanks, Richard. And here's a few examples. Uh, the one on the left is, is basically a reference analyzer. Uh, it's associated with, in this case, a, a fairly uh, small landfill pond uh, desludging. Um, it, it causes a number of odor complaints. So there was uh, some, some monitoring implications there. And then on the right-hand side, just some uh, uh, odor monitoring. Uh, this particular one is a static sample, but uh, the sample in question can be used to collect samples periodically. Thanks, Richard. So how does this progress in terms of the new act? Uh, we're seeing internationally trend for multiple low-cost particle, uh, sorry, uh, methane monitors. Uh, sometimes these are co-located with uh, organosulfur enoses, although I'll put a bit of a, a caution on those uh, devices shortly. And they're often used as part of a distributed network around a boundary of a property. They can provide some useful insight into ambient concentrations, but they really need to be used in conjunction with meteorological monitoring. Obviously, the way the wind speed and wind direction is absolutely critical for uh, ambient monitoring. So just uh, as I mentioned earlier, some of those uh, ENOS devices are available and they do work. Uh, but my experience with them to date is they do suffer from a, a number of different effects, including humidity. They do tend to drift a bit. And there are a number of positive interferences. The most common ones that people have encountered are alcohols, but uh, there are a number of others as well. So I guess while they're a, a work in progress, I would just caution people just to be a little bit careful with those ENO devices. Uh, Long-term outdoor deployments have generally had limited success to date. I am aware of a few cases where they have worked well, but uh, they tend to be the exception rather than the rule. Thanks, Richard. And that's just uh, an example of a, an ENOS device uh, that's uh, been developed uh, by NASA uh, for uh, monitoring uh, various things on, on spacecraft, but that gives you an idea of, of, of the type of devices that are being used. Thanks, Richard. <laughs> 
Uh, so in terms of landfills, uh, obviously traditionally uh, people do uh, basically um, uh, surveys, landfill surveys, uh, often with uh, either people walking uh, or uh, using uh, PID units. Uh, those are photo ionization detectors. And the ones we tend to use are basically uh, a differential optical methods. So it's just basically uh, a folded beam. Uh, thanks, Richard. So on the left, uh, you can just see uh, on the front of the golf cart, there's a uh, basically one of those folded beam devices. It's got a basically about a 15 metre path length, just bounces the beam in, inside and back, uh, just measures methane, and it produces a spatial map. So the image on the right is, is typically what you'd see. Those people that operate these types of things will be very familiar with these types of, uh, of maps. They basically highlight areas where uh, there are methane gases arising and very commonly, there's, there's quite strong relationship between odorous gases, your organosulfur compounds typically, or sometimes amines, uh, associated with those methane deposits. Thanks, Richard. So what you tend to do uh, then is, once you've got spatial surveys, the next thing you can look at is flux measurements, or, or potentially eddy covariance, or that's getting a little bit sophisticated for most of our applications. Basically involves uh, putting a, a monitor over some of those hot spots that we've identified before, and just measuring how they're changing over time. Uh, for both uh, landfills in particular, there, there is obviously a, a change in time as the landfill ages, uh, and it's necessary to, to uh, resurvey, uh, but typically they, they're used. Commonly, we're well, not commonly, uh, occasionally we're seeing optical flux towers used for this, but they're quite expensive and very specialized equipment. Uh, some of you will be aware of the FLIR technology, forward looking infrared. Uh, it's reduced in price, but still quite expensive, and uh, it it's, uh, tends to be more useful for, for sort of spot readings and, and indicators, although I am aware increasingly it is being used as, as permanent mounts to overlook a particular site. Uh, so what we're starting to see now is, is for this uh, general environmental uh, directives to, to try and look at open path monitoring alongside low-cost low detectors around the boundary of the sites. And this typically represents uh, what we call BPR, best practical option, best practical means, depending on which part of the world you're in. Thanks, Richard. And that's uh, just an image from a FLIR camera. This particular one is, is taken showing some emissions from the uh, tundra in Siberia, uh, just showing the uh, basically methane escapes from particular parts of, uh, of the tundra. Thank you. All right, so um, I'm probably gonna pass back to Richard now. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you again for your time. Well, thanks very much, Paul. We've got quite a few questions to get through, so I'll sum up quickly. Um, the key learnings, I think, to take home from this is there's a lot of new regulation. I've done my best to get my head around that for you today. Um, compliance with the ERS criteria is not necessarily enough to meet the general environmental duty. So we're moving towards more about what's the maximum we can do to prevent emitting. Absence of the criteria in the ERS does not mean a parameter does not need to be monitored. New guidance on how to monitor ambient air pollution has been finalized and will be released before the end of 2021. New odor guidance is on its way and adaptive management and continuous monitoring of performance appears to be the trend for the future. And I would say that what Paul's shown us today, that the trend will be towards probably multi-sensor low-cost networks or low-cost multi-sensor networks, um, moving away from such a dependence on reference stations. Um, so over to Q&A, we've got a lot to get through. No one's followed my instruction of not typing in the chat, but that's okay. We'll start with the Q&A though. David Detrick, it's interesting to see odor in the ERS and objectives as free of offensive odors, monitored by complaints or odor units. Uh, good question. I think we might wait for that new odor guidance document to come out. At the moment, the way that we're assessing odour has not, that guidance hasn't changed yet, but there's that change on the way. Uh, Simon Tremlett, are the new guidelines more aligned with US EPA or the more restrictive EU standards? 
I'm not sure, Simon, to be honest, but perhaps, Paul, do you have a context of um, the EU standards and the, the US EPA standards? Yeah, they both basically provide a bit of a backstop. So you'll be aware that uh, there is uh, clear uh, compliance limits, but increasingly what we're seeing now is uh, things like good practice guides or, or uh, best practice BPO and BPM coming on top of that. And that's where the uh, the general environmental directives or the continual improvement is, is kind of an additional layer that is, is superimposed on top of those standards. Uh, I, I don't think the, the new guidelines are necessarily aligned with either the UP, uh, the US EPA or the EU. It's just more of an international trend towards uh, just continually improvement rather than polluting up to a standard. Okay. Are there any vibration standards in the ERS? That's a good question. David, you've got a lot of questions here. I might uh, email you separately in response to those given the short amount of time I've got to answer those other chat questions. So I'll shoot you an email in response to those questions, including the one about noise. Um, Back on Simon Tremlett, how does the cost of maintaining distributed systems compare when QAL2 and QAL3 requirements are to be met? Do you have an answer to that question, Paul? No, I don't actually, Simon. That is a good question. Uh, typically, the, the more detailed uh, the distribution system, uh, the more costs are involved. I think that's probably a case by case basis. Uh, I've seen other jurisdictions where the cost is, is effectively uh, goes up almost by an order of magnitude each time. I don't think that is the case in this context. And I think it really come down to a case by case scenario. So um, I probably can't provide any more detail than that, I'm afraid, Simon. So just before we move off that one, Paul, so the, obviously the, the capital expenditure for these sort of low cost sensor networks would initially be cheaper, like comparing with a reference station. Are, are you saying that over the long period, you think because there's just more sensors out there that it's gonna cost more to maintain? No, not necessarily. I think uh, what typically happens with these types of things is the, the regulators like to retain the existing monitoring array that's already in place. So that's those reference stations. What they like to do is supplement it with, with lower cost monitoring. Uh, in time, what you can do is use that lower cost monitoring to demonstrate that some of those reference stations are superfluous. They're no longer needed simply because uh, another reference station is, is uh, capable of, of covering that information. So in, in, you know, in the medium to long term, the, the costs tend to come down. The cost of those lower monitoring devices, uh, I've given people an indication of the likely cost associated with that, uh, but it, it tends to be a, a you know, compliance plus rather than an alternative. Right. Okay, so we would need a shift away from the, the EPA's current sort of, uh, I guess, certified systems for measuring compliance to, to, to a greater acceptance of these more indicator. Yes. Yeah, the, the EPA has accepted. I mean, they do use these uh, devices themselves uh, for various studies. So there is a general acceptance. They have a, a, a place. Uh, I think uh, some of the criticisms and some of those disadvantages we touched, touched on are, are, are well, you know, the, the EPA is well aware of those. And they'll be just looking at saying, hey, look, if we're going to use these instruments, they're great for certain certain tasks. And one of those uh, tasks, it seems to me, is, is very clearly, it fits quite nicely into that GED, you know, General Environmental Directive of, of basically continually improving things and demonstrating that improvement, particularly where it may not be obvious uh, from, from, you know, a, a traditional reference station. Okay, now we're going to move to the chat section, which uh, has quite a few in it. Nice photo of Altona coastline from David. Uh, trouble reading this one. 
Okay, so we've got some to and fro communication, sorry. So I have seen that one. Thumbs up from someone, thank you. <laughs> Could you please tell us what are the most common problems, main contaminants about urban groundwater? I don't know, thanks. Um, well, not today, um, Giuseppe, but more than happy to discuss with you. Um, in terms of the main contaminants around air quality, though, Paul, what would you say the big ones are at the moment? Um, <clears throat> traditionally, uh, in urban areas, they tend to be, uh, previously they were particulate, but we've seen uh, internationally particulate levels have dropped. Uh, we're seeing increasing levels of nitrogen dioxide uh, and in and around urban centres, and that that is just reflective of the change in, uh, in vehicle emission uh, technology over time. So, so NO2 is uh, becoming more problematic for a couple of areas. Uh, as temperatures increase in various parts of the world, we're also seeing ozone increasingly becoming a, a bit of a challenge. Uh, and there are some great low cost uh, ozone monitoring devices uh, entering the market these days. Um, so in terms of uh, urban pollutants, I, I would say CO is, is carbon monoxide is, is generally no longer an issue. Uh, perhaps in some third world countries it may be, but largely it's, it's uh, being dealt with. Uh, NO2 uh, is, and the World Health Organization guidelines are likely to show reductions in, uh, in, in international standards there. So the, tight, the, the those guidelines are going to become more restrictive over time. Uh, we'll probably see uh, smaller uh, time horizons for particular and we're seeing with increasing vehicles, uh, sorry, increasing EVs on the market, electric vehicles, uh, we're seeing those non-tailpipe emissions, things like brake and tyre wear, uh, starting to become a little bit more problematic. So I suspect the focus will become on those things over time. Thanks, Richard. Um, one did I did want to ask you about is, I know that uh, Moat was involved with, I think it was a university over there in Auckland setting up a a broad monitoring network for wood smoke. Uh, were you involved in that project? Yeah, we are. Uh, we do quite a bit of uh, wood smoke monitoring in, in various centres uh, here in New Zealand. Uh, we don't uh, always have the, uh, the sunny, warm climates that uh, uh, the Australian, uh, northern uh, parts of Australia tend to enjoy, although I am aware that you guys have a bit of a wood smoke problem uh, in Melbourne, certain parts of Melbourne, certainly down in Tasmania as well. So we've done a bit of work there and, and it's been quite interesting. The, the granularity you can get from those uh, small monitors uh, really shows that uh, where the reference analyzers are uh, may not necessarily be capturing uh, where those peak emissions are. Uh, and also uh, the modeling that has been done on uh, some of those communities uh, wasn't really uh, capturing what was happening at all. So, so when we actually went and did the monitoring, uh, we found quite a different picture uh, than, than what was actually predicted, um, which has caused the modelers to, to reevaluate their models and, and improve them as a consequence. So um, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of been a bit of a win-win for everyone. One thing that interested me in that, that project was, um, I was, I was talking with Brett Wells about this, was the ability to detect when you needed to go out and check the function of a sensor based on the predicted uh, concentration that should have been reported at a sensor versus what was actually seen. So a sort of uh, reactive maintenance program based on using modeling as the benchmarking, which I found pretty interesting. Yeah, that's, that's basically becoming increasingly common now where, where you have these low cost distributed networks, you effectively run algorithms across them and they're not necessarily sophisticated, but what they'll do is they'll look at the, the variation in concentrations between instruments and also within an instrument. And where there is a change, uh, you can often identify it or, or, or associate it either with uh, a, an instrument or an instrumental issue uh, an environmental issue, uh, or in some cases, a change in, in emissions. So the data itself can be really useful for basically drilling down and saying, hey, yeah, the situation's changed, the pattern's changed, uh, and then looking into what that may be. Uh, so in some cases, uh, you know, often with these uh, these sensors, they, they do align very strongly with uh, reference analyzers, and it's great uh, that that occurs, uh, but uh, the value really comes in, in uh, figuring out what's going on and behind the scenes. Uh, one one thing's for sure, like we used to think we didn't need 
to have smoke monitoring, but uh, after the bushfires, uh, what we had, uh, it's becoming more important. Do you ever do monitoring of smoke uh, in you know vineyards and vineyard areas? I know that there's there's a huge amount of damage and loss of um, of crop because of uh, smoke taint of um, grapes up in our um, up around Wangaratta and areas like that. Um, have you been involved with that at all? Yeah, we have a bit. Uh, we found that uh, I think uh, a couple of years back when you guys had the uh, those last uh, substantial wood fires, uh, you're kind enough to to send a lot of that smoke our way. Uh, <laughs> and uh, around three or four days later, we uh, yeah we got hit by it. So yeah, we 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 had quite a bit of it was uh, around November December from memory. So a number of our uh, crops were were it's fairly early in our season, but uh, a number of our crops were adversely affected, and we did get uh, uh, involved in in monitoring around that time. Uh, the grapes a little bit early for the grapes, but uh, we did have uh, quite a few of our, our stone fruit, our cherries, and and uh, there was a, a big concern around uh, tainting, uh, mainly for our export crops. So we got involved in that, and uh, and and uh, were able to provide some uh, useful assistance to some of those orchardists. Because it's really important if they can be um, warned early, they can cut costs because they know they're going to write off their crop. You know, so it's it's um, it's a value. So I might catch up with you after about this. I've just noticed that there's three new Q&As, so I better have a quick look at that. Or am I mistaken? Got some Simon Tremlett. They currently use decibels 12.5 hertz to 20 kilohertz, even for vibration slash LFE complaint monitoring. I might catch up with you afterwards, Simon, to get a bit more detail on that. I can circulate that out to the group. Another one from Peter Richardson. Do you know when new guidance stocks on source air pollution monitoring for regulatory purposes will be published? A very good question. So only going what I was told sort of yesterday by EPA is that um, they're obviously splitting what was one document into two and now there's the, um, so you've got the one we've just gone through and then you've got a separate one for the point source. So I'm not sure if they're progressing at the same speed or not, but I will check and come back to you. I'll have to speak to the EPA and, and check in on that, but they will be able to tell me. The point source guidance. One thing's for sure, there's a lot of new guidance and <laughs> it takes a bit to get through it all. Um, okay, well, we're about five minutes over our time frame. Um, I think we've been through all the questions. Look, thanks very much for your attendance today. We had a really great turnout and Paul, it's, uh, it's a credit to you that, that we had so many here today. So thank you very much. And uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to have a, a true specialist on a webinar series talking about air quality monitoring. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with Paul and myself, just shoot me an email and I will connect you up. Um, but thank you very much for attending today. Really appreciate uh, your attendance and your questions. Uh, thanks very much. And thanks, Paul. Thank you, Richard. All the best, everyone. Bye.